And here we are, first episode ever of What the Funk. What the Funk is What the Funk? Well, it's a podcast. Similar to Tripping Over the Barrel, where I'm guessing a lot of the listeners on the show are coming from, I want to bring out the personalities and the lighter side of the oil and gas, energy, and energy technology industries. As a lot of you know, my dear friend and uh, podcast co-host, Tim Lozer, passed away in May. We did a few tribute episodes to close out Tripping Over the Barrel. 97 episodes with Tim and I, five episodes of tribute. Took a pretty extended break, and now I'm ready to launch What the Funk. The format here is going to be a little bit different. Nobody can fill Tim's shoes. Totally impossible. So I'm going to have rotating guest co-host, Mr. Joe Sinnott, checking in out of Pittsburgh as our first rotating guest co-host. And then we'll bring on different guests every episode, ideally somebody that has chemistry with the rotating co-host. So Dave Callahan of... Mechanicsburg, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, <laughs> representing the Marcellus Shale Coalition, is our first guest. So, Joe, since you and Dave have a little bit more background, why don't you, A, introduce yourself, who are you, since our listeners have no idea who you are, then introduce Dave, and Dave, we can kind of get to know you, shoot the shit, and have fun. All right. Well, I am Joe Sinnott. I am here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I've lived for about 15 years now, came up in the early days of the Marcellus, uh, as an engineer, worked for 11 years, mostly for EQT Corporation up here before transitioning into the world of leadership development coaching, still focused on the oil and gas industry. And over the last couple of years, as I've grown my own business, one organization that I was happy to join is the Marcellus Shale Coalition, led by Dave Callahan. So over the last year or so, have had the pleasure of interacting with Dave Callahan uh, multiple times as part of, again, the Marcella Shale Coalition, and thought he was a no-brainer guest for kicking off the What the Funk podcast, especially representing Marcellus, which I think, Jeremy, is why I'm here. I think I'm supposed to somewhat represent the Marcellus, but I would much rather defer to somebody who actually does that as his day job as head of the Marcella Shale Coalition. So again, happy to uh, have had the opportunity to invite Dave Callahan, happy for the opportunity to be a rotating co-host and happy to welcome you, Dave Callahan, to the first episode of the What the Funk podcast. Thank you, gentlemen. It's great to be with you both today. Appreciate that. So, Joe, just quick correction. Um, no, you're not here to represent the Marcellus. You're here because you just have a perfect podcast voice. Let's be honest, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever brought me on the show today, Jeremy, I appreciate it. Whether it's genetics or something else, I'll, uh, I'm happy to be here and happy to be with you and Dave. Well, you're a Jersey boy, just like my dad. So we've, we've got that connection too. So Dave Callahan, who are you, Dave? Where did you grow up? Um, where'd you go to school? I think I saw that you're an orange man at, at least at some point. Um, how did you get to where you are and give us a little bit about your upbringing, education, career, and what led you to leading the Marcellus Shale Coalition? We only have 45 minutes, right? <laughs> we'll see. All right. Well, born and raised here in Pennsylvania, uh, in the northwest corner of Pennsylvania in good old McKean County in a town called Bradford, Pennsylvania. If any of you in Pennsylvania or the Appalachian region uh, watch the local weather during the wintertime, you'll see us as the cold spot generally uh, <laughs> for, for low temperatures. Uh, as I've shared previously, home of what used to be Kendall Motor Oil, uh, an old smaller refinery up there run by American Refining. Uh, you know, Zippo lighters up there. I worked there for a year between undergrad and grad school and uh, case pocket knives, things like that. A good, good manufacturing town. And it's a town where the oil industry, you know, thrived in the 1800s, late 1800s into the early part of the 20th century. So I grew up around the extractive industries. I mean, we had uh, we had a pump jack in the backyard. Uh, pump jack across the street uh, on a hillside. Mind you, they weren't ours. But, uh, you know, some people you go to bed listening to the crickets with the windows open at night, we'd hear the pump jack cycle on and off. So uh, it's been a part of life. A um, little bit more, as long as you can, you can stop me at any point. I said, I know we've got 45 right. minutes. So uh, growing up, um, my dad worked and my mother worked for Columbia Gas. Uh, distribution company, worked there for 43 years, 
grandfather worked there before that. I had other relatives who worked in and around, you know, the distribution side of the industry. So when it came time to uh, to look for a job, you know, I gravitated toward the industry, and I was lucky to work in the, in this business, you know, upwards of uh, thirty one years now. Uh, you did say Syracuse. Uh, I went there to grad school. Uh, they're politically correct. They're the orange now, where we have the the wonderful mascot of a big orange, you know, preacher. Um, before that, went to a good state system of higher education school here in Pennsylvania called IUP, Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Um, studied political science, otherwise known as Unemployment 101, um, <laughs> in, in both instances. Uh, so uh, trying to put some of that some of that to good use here. Love it. Love it. So, um, well, there's a couple of things we know about you now. You like living in blue collar towns. There, nothing is more. I looked on your LinkedIn profile or sorry, my crack research team, as Tim would say, look, we had them look at your uh, LinkedIn profile and you have a town called Mechanicsburg. There's no more blue collar sounding name than Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. I mean, come they on, drop right? a wrench on New Year's Eve. Yes. Yes. Uh, apparently <laughs> they, they fixed, you know, you know, wagons back in the day when, when horse drawn wagons were, were the way to get around. So, yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. And then uh, obviously the hometown of, of Zippo and, and lots of oil and gas, but also you're, you're obviously not afraid of the cold, right? This is one thing about you too. If, if you don't mind upstate New York, certainly you can deal with, with cold weather. So you gave us some of your education. Um, talk about your career, right? So you said 31 years or so in the oil and gas industry. And I know in the Marcellus, you guys refer to that this is the gas industry. It was the coal industry for a while and really transitioned nicely into natural gas. Um, what were some of your first jobs? And then what have you done in your 31 years in, in oil and gas? Sure. Primarily engaged in advocacy, uh, legislative regulatory advocacy. Uh, worked with uh, a couple of state trade associations early on. First one representing some local governments here in Pennsylvania. You know, they're in, I, I don't know where you are located, but here in PA, there's no unincorporated land whatsoever. There, there's everything is covered by some form of government, not just the county. There's, you know, vast numbers of local governments. And I worked for an organization representing all the townships in the state. From there, I went into primarily working in the energy industry. You know, I've worked for trade associations representing the interstate pipelines, local distribution companies. I did some lobbying as a contract lobbyist uh, for a company called Enron and a few other energy interests back in the day. Them. Yeah, them. yeah, vaguely. Um, a little bit of work for I ran the uh, Pennsylvania office for the American Petroleum Institute for a few years and uh, really settled in in this industry just a couple of years after it got its start. I've been working in what we call the unconventional space since 2010, uh, working with uh, the coalition itself, working with the midstream company, and also working with uh, a producer as well. But happy to be here at the MSC. It's a great organization. We've got great members like Joe. It, I like to think of it as kind of a family atmosphere. You know, we're a tight knit group in this industry. Right, we got to stick together. We a lot of us are, are recycled. We we might move from job to job, but we're still involved in the industry. The business cards might change, but uh, yeah, we're we're all very close. Yeah, well, I agree with the closeness. Although you just used the word family, and I gotta, I don't know, I don't know if it's a plug for the MSC or if it's uh, if it's something maybe on the other side of the equation because we're in the midst of the holidays as we record this, and all of this information that you get as being part of the MSC about the nitty gritty world of Again, politics and all these, you know, different layers of government that Dave just mentioned. You know, I steal a lot of that and I try to pretend like I'm the smartest man in the room talking about Pennsylvania state politics or Pennsylvania Commonwealth politics, whatever you want to call it, thanks to all this information coming in from the MSC. So my question for you is, Dave, are you as unpopular at family gatherings? Can you turn <laughs> off your connection to all the, you know, again, the nitty gritty stuff that I think, what do we have, 12 million people in the state? I mean, I don't know if anybody really knows about it outside of our world. So I'm curious in your day to day, you know, what do people think of you? What, what, <laughs> are, are, do they roll their eyes uh, like I get, you know, the reaction that I get? Uh, first of all, I have many ways of being unpopular at family gatherings. It has nothing to do with my job. But nice. uh, no, there, there are ways to talk about what we do, how we do it. I mean, I, I'm lucky I still have some parents around. They're 90 and 92. 
And I try to think that when I talk to family gatherings, when I talk to media at some point, you know, it's like I'm talking to them, you know, trying to explain it, take it down to its basic, basic level. You need heat, you need power, you know, you need all these things in our lives, you know, plastic coated drinking cups and other things. We need all these things in our lives. And thank you. Energy is the key. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the further northeast you go, so I'm originally from New Hampshire, went to college just outside of Boston. My parents are teachers. They're extremely liberal. And what happens when you live on that side of the table is you just vilify oil and gas. It just happens, right? And oftentimes it's due to a total lack of education. Does the Marcellus Shale Coalition try to provide some of that education for the novices out there? Like, what exactly does your group do? Um, what would you say you do here, Dave? Well, obviously what we do is we, we represent the industry, all facets of the industry. As I like to say, Joe's heard it a number of times from wellhead to burner tip and beyond. You know, so we, we represent the producers, the pipeline companies, the, uh, uh, the, the gas processors and fractionators, the distributors and others involved in the industry as well. But what we try to do is obviously legislative and regulatory advocacy is a big part of what we do. Uh, we, we, we deal in facts and we also try to educate the public, whether they're experts in the industry or novices in the industry. And, you know, Joe attended a meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago that we that we conducted where I shared that, you know, we have tons of, of output on social media. We have a lot of output. We have a blog that we put out roughly once a week. It's generally as conditions or as events warrant, but it works out to about once a week. But on social media, we're putting out roughly four and a half posts a day on various wow. channels. Yeah. So news items, you name it. We get a lot of information out there. We have more facts in, than, than, than you could shake a stick at on our website. Fact sheets. We have lots of newsy blogs. We've got everything you, you really need to get up to speed on energy issues and particularly on natural gas issues here. All right. Well, I got a question on that then. So I was at the meeting that, that Dave just described. You talked about all those facts. I'll admit that sometimes being part of the industry and ingesting so much sort of you know industry generated content, I get a little desensitized sometimes because, again, I've heard this story, right? You know, preaching to the choir, whatever. What do you think, Dave, actually resonates with? the Marcellus Shale Coalition's target audience. You know, do you have a feel for what actually gets people to pause and say, huh, that's interesting. You know, I haven't heard that before since, again, I, I imagine, uh, you know, that's, that's the audience that you want to try to sway as opposed to uh, sort of the, the internal and, and more fossil fuel friendly folks, if you will. Well, I think there's some broad themes that always resonate, uh, whether you're dealing with experts or novices um, and, or I should say the general public. Some of those themes include <clears throat> reliability. You know, look at energy events around the world. Jeremy, look at your, your friends and neighbors uh, up in New England. They're gonna go through yet another winter where they're kind of, I'm gonna use the, the New England ISO operators words from last year. It's gonna take a combination of skill and luck to make it through the winter. We're talking, about the, we're talking about the world's most advanced economy and we have regions that are wondering how they can make it through the winter when we've got tremendous supplies of natural gas that can provide heat, provide uh, uh, you know energy for power generation and more to help them get through that winter. Anyway, that's reliability always resonates with audiences. Some can't be uh, they can't be you know. Well, let me let me just backtrack something that, that we really can't lose focus of, and that is the environmental benefits of natural gas. While we can be vilified on, on some fronts by some agents and some forces, there is no there's no discounting the fact that increased use of natural gas has led to incredibly clean air in this country and has led to incredibly lower CO2 emissions. That resonates with people when they realize it. And finally, the other thing is something that we, we just talked about, and that is all the products that are derived from natural gas. And the fact that if we want to be more energy secure, if we want to reshore manufacturing, let's use that natural gas to make some of those products here. So natural gas creating cleaner air, reducing CO2. Let's talk about that a little bit, Dave. I know that that's something that, that you at the Marcellus Shale Coalition has touched on, but can you provide a little bit more detail? Because I think people generally think 
the opposite, that natural gas is putting more CO2 into the environment. Um, can you educate us, school us a little bit? Certainly, certainly. As I usually say in interviews and discussions, whether it's around a kitchen table or elsewhere, you know, you have to equally weight the economic and environmental benefits of the utilization of this great resource. Um, the air is cleaner than it's been since the beginning of the since before the Industrial Revolution. You know, the air is, it, you know, the criteria pollutants are all down in Pennsylvania. They're down significantly. This is after Thanksgiving. I don't remember all the data, but, it, but <laughs> you know, SO2 emissions down more than 80 some percent. Uh, and CO2 emissions, <clears throat> in particular from the power generation sector, they're down here in Pennsylvania by 41 percent since 2005, thanks wow. to increased use of natural gas. It's a big part of our energy future. It's a big part of our clean energy future. It's developed here under the most stringent regulations in the country, if not the world. And if you think about supplying natural gas to our friends and allies across the globe, where else would they want that natural gas source, but in a region that, that has very strong regulations and where it's developed cleanly? Yeah. Couldn't well, agree you just mentioned the future there, Dave. Again, it's a great story. I don't want to deviate from it, but what does the future look like? You know, I don't know if, again, I'm happy to be a part of the Marcel Shell Coalition, but I kind of assume that you and your board members there have some sort of crystal ball and you know what things are going to look like five to 10 years down the road, right? So I am curious, what, what is that? Well, I mean, in your view, whether it's here in, in Pennsylvania or elsewhere, you know, like, what does it look like? What, where are we headed? Well, I'm an optimist about our industry just because I'm a believer in what it can do, not just for the Appalachian region, not just for the United States, but for the world. We've got upwards of 3 billion people in the world who live in energy poverty. I think in five to 10 years, you're going to see natural gas even do even more things to help people get out of energy poverty. <clears throat> I think we're going to see this region, and I hope this region, as a result of more common sense being used at the federal and state levels for policy making, you know, expanding pipeline capacity, adding another export facility or export facilities here in the East Coast to complement what we already have down the road down in Maryland. I see a bright future for this industry just because the resource is so great, just because of you know, what I see being done in the field, the innovations day in and day out, the steps that the industry is taking <clears throat> day in and day out. You know, one thing, Joe, I don't know if you've mentioned on your podcast or not, but, um, you know, any number of our companies and the majority of them, I would say, of the larger companies are working with third parties, uh, with groups like Project Canary, MIQ, Equitable Origins, to certify their operations as responsible. That's important to the companies. It's important to their investors. It's important to their stakeholders. And it's important to their customers whether it's you know, a local utility down the road or a utility across the Atlantic in Europe. Yep, yep. Shout out Earthview Corporation, one of Funk Futures clients. It's actually my call right after this, but they're putting uh, low cost emission sniffers on wells. And we're seeing an immense amount of demand from all types of oil and gas companies. And beyond that, uh, you know, the, the DOE, we're seeing landfills trying to capture emissions. I know that was sort of a hot topic with the, the new rice entity that was in your neck of the woods as well. This is, to me, not a partisan issue. Energy is a right that everybody should have. It's a bare necessity. And you mentioned the term energy poverty, and this is where I get really frustrated. I don't understand why energy is such a politically charged issue. It really shouldn't be. And I do think that people like you, Dave, are doing a nice job bringing facts to the table and eliminating some of the innuendo um, that exists out there that people make these broad determinations. And I'll just say this, right? I live in Colorado. I'm in Boulder County, Colorado. And there are some people who don't want to support me, my company, or the industry just because of what I'm involved in. And to me, that's crazy. It's like, but you're using natural gas to heat your home all winter. What about all the baking that you do in your kitchen, right? So there's a lot of virtue signaling you know, you want to charge your Tesla. Well, it doesn't just come from magic, right? What's the breakdown of the electricity that's coming into your home to allow you to charge your electric vehicle? So I really appreciate what you're doing. And I, were, I wish there were more of these groups. What I tend to see here in Colorado is you do have some groups like Energy Strong and, and others 
but it tends to be a little more combative. I think the years of frustration has really weighted on people. And you start to see a little bit of this, like, you want to shut us down, so we're going to come back and be really angry toward you. Um, and I'm not sure if that's the right approach to take. I think that this has to be a collaborative effort. But at the same time, I understand it. I understand the frustration people have, and you're trying to not allow me to heat my home and shut down my industry. I'm not going to allow that to happen. So it's a fine line, but it's a line that the industry as a whole has to tiptoe through. I want to talk about coal a little bit. So the Marcellus Shale Coalition, Dave, is uh, not just Pennsylvania, right? I mean, the Marcellus Shale goes all the way up and down almost the eastern corridor, right? You're talking about all the way down to places like um, Kentucky, right, through Virginia, West Virginia, which is a huge coal hub. Have you seen a massive reduction in the amount of coal that's, um, I guess, mined uh, due to the increase of natural gas extraction in the Northeast? Well, first of all, I mean, our organization is Pennsylvania-based. There are sister organizations, cousins, whatever we want to call the family, in those states of Kentucky, Ohio, West Virginia. We've got great working relationships with them. Um, we've seen market forces uh, you know, at play at where folks have favored natural gas in particular for electric generation. Um, so I've, I've seen a bit of a difference, but we need all sources of energy if we want to have a reliable electric grid, if we want to allow our economy to grow. And we can't deny the rest of the world from having, you know, an all the above energy portfolio as well. Absolutely. So I guess you mentioned our cousins or sisters or whomever in other states, Dave, in terms of the collaboration with those other states or even collaboration within Pennsylvania, you know, what, what's the lay of the land there? You know, are, are people jockeying for position? You hear a lot about the, you know, fighting for the money for the potential hydrogen hubs that the federal government is is dangling out there. You know, I'm I'm fortunate to have gotten some insights and have some conversations with some of the outside groups. But I'm curious, your you know, what you see in terms of the collaboration that's existing and the collaboration that's necessary with those cousins, with those sisters, whatever again, whatever that family tree looks like <laughs> as we approach whatever the, you know, obviously, uh, you know, whatever common goal that we all have. Well, here's part of it. Uh, um, you know, Pennsylvania is a big state. We've got folks in the eastern part <clears throat> who are vying for, for some of that, uh, for some of that pot. We've got folks in the western part who are vying for part of that. And quite frankly, you know, the state borders, you know, are <laughs> you know, they're not definitive for this. So the folks in Philadelphia are probably working with the friends in, in Jersey and Delaware, just as eventually um, the people in Western PA will be working with Ohio and West Virginia. Look, the resource stretches across these, these different states. The workers come across the borders, the suppliers, the companies who help do all the work to get the natural gas out of the ground, the companies that will be producing hydrogen, the companies that will be, you know, sinking carbon into the ground. Will be operating in different regions as well. I think initially there'll probably be some parochialism where it'll be PA this, Ohio that, New Jersey that, but eventually I think you'll see some things come together. <laughs> well, actually, well, I guess more important to that though, from a sports standpoint, Dave, you know, I entered the MSC, you know, again, with sort of a Pittsburgh centric view, I found myself conversing with people from New Jersey, from the other side of the state. And, you know, you got to balance things a little bit there. <laughs> How do you do that? You're sitting in the center of the state there. You're, you're dealing with all kinds of different entities. How do you, you know, balance the sports allegiances when it comes to whether it's membership, you know, my fellow members, sisters, cousins, whatever within the MSC or other, uh, you know, political entities and government entities who, you know, have arguably, you know, more, uh, you know, more fire and perhaps more biases than even people have against the energy industry. So very important question for sports. How do you that? We're a big tent. All sports teams are welcome. But you could say it this way. You know, you could you could also do it without, you know, pitting one team against each other, Philadelphia versus Pittsburgh or elsewhere. But you do have common common enemies in the sports world. So, Jeremy, I don't want to make you you pull up your, your sweatshirt again. But uh, I would say the folks common in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh have a certain aversion to the team that's on your, your sweatshirt there. Or perhaps folks from down in the oil patch in Dallas. So there, there are ways to deal with this, Joe. It's about being creative with your with your advocacy. It's a, I mean, it is a huge football hub where you grew up, certainly, and even where you live now. I think you almost have to visit that area to understand. I think nationally, a lot of people think of Texas, Florida, 
places like that where everybody really just lives and breathes football, but it originated in your neck of the woods, right? In, in Ohio and Pennsylvania, you just look at the game, the game this past weekend with Joe's two favorite rivals, Ohio state and Michigan going at it. And it was nice to see uh, a little change of pace in that game with Michigan coming home. I don't particularly care, but you know, I'll root for Tom Brady's team because of all the happiness and joy Tom Brady has caused for me. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate that. I'm sure you're listening. Um, I did notice that a touchdown was taken away. uh, I believe from the Patriots this weekend on a play that looked suspiciously like a play that uh, they took a, a touchdown away from the Steelers in a, in a very hard fought game against the Patriots a number of years ago. So Takes a while. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Really appreciate you bringing that up. It was a really fun Thanksgiving night for me, gritting my teeth all night. But um, yeah, it's like, you know, trying to balance the the past and the future is very hard. When you're in the midst of the game, none of the past matters, right? You just want to win that game. But correct. Uh, we certainly all have that bond with with football and we and we have a bond with the uh, with the industry. You mentioned sort of the familial nature of it. One of the things that you said earlier on this podcast was the business cards change, but the faces are the same. And I've actually heard that exact reference for the NAEP conference, right? It's like, oh, who are you with now? But it's, but it's you, right? I mean, I've gone to, I don't know, 15 NAEPs or so at this point, and I've probably worked with a half dozen companies in that time. That's not what matters, right? It's the people that matter. It's not necessarily the companies that matter. And, and I'm sure you see that a lot too in, in Pennsylvania. I mean, look, the EQT team has mostly turned over, Joe. Like when you were over there, it was sort of a more gray haired crew that had been around for a while that had dealt with sort of the spinning off of different divisions um, of the company between utility and, and natural gas and coal. And now you see sort of that rice crew come in and bring a little bit of a younger vibe, more people working remotely, satellite offices. I think they have one out in the Cannonsburg area um, or Washington uh, and, and may even be doing away with the downtown office. So you're seeing these things change, but ultimately the goals of these companies are the same. Produce clean energy, be good stewards for their community and their industry, um, and ideally create, uh, create value for their shale, shale, uh, shareholders in the cleanest possible way as producers. You know, one of the things that I've seen that's a big evolution, and, and Dave, maybe this is something you've seen too, is just the general electrification um, of the asset. So it, it may be things like, um, you know, electrification of fleets, electric vehicles. Now with the IRA, which has come to the table, there's actually significant benefits and bonuses for companies to reduce their cost of tax that they have to pay to the government for the electrification of fleets. Uh, Electric uh, frack fleets is another one, right? I know uh, Cold Bore Technologies has done a lot of work out there. Um, Have you seen some of these shifts as well, Dave? Because to me, it's tertiary, right? I see these things out in the field, electric generators, so on and so forth. Um, But how has that kind of evolved, at least in the last, call it 5, 10, 15 years, where we are seeing companies more so do their part uh, to be more green. Sure, you see a lot of, uh, of work out in the field on that. You know, the use of field gas, you know, maybe even seven, eight years ago, was primarily limited to compressor stations where the compressors ran on field gas. Now you could see field gas used for, for drilling to generate power uh, for drilling rigs. You see it uh, for, for hydraulic fracturing and more. I think there, it's just an ongoing evolution. I, 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 I hesitate to use the word transition because transition sounds like a beginning and an end. We're going to turn a switch. It's more of an evolution of the industry. And it's, it's what we fight for every day is to, le- to allow this industry to continue to evolve, to allow technology to continue to be developed, to allow you know, the best and the brightest to put their minds at work on ensuring that this industry keeps moving ahead. Uh, it keeps propelling this industry and our strong energy future. You know, it's it's what's at stake in public policy when the government tries to pick winners and thereby, you know, labeling losers. We need to allow innovation to continue without strong words from the government saying we're going to shut you down in six or eight years. Or as they did over in, in Egypt uh, over the past couple of weeks, saying we want a document that says we're going to we're going to stop fossil fuels. Well, how about saying we're going to allow industry to flourish? We're going to allow, you know, again, massive 
investments to be made in this industry and others to allow that economic and environmental progress to continue. Yeah, totally. So to allow that continuation to sort of fight against irrational government rules and regulations, how do you do it, Dave? Again, I, you know, I'm fortunate to be part of, of the MSC. Obviously, I'm not on the front lines. I'm not in Harrisburg. But can you shed a little color on how the MSC actually helps inform those decision makers that actually have an impact on the future of the industry? You know, what is your tact? What is your team's tact? How do you, you know, how do you enable my fellow members to, to make a difference? Can you shed a little color on you know, the, sort of the nitty gritty, how that actually happens? It's, it's day-to-day sharing of information with policymakers at all levels of government. It's aligning ourselves with our partners, aligning ourselves with our partners in other states, aligning ourselves with folks like the construction trade unions, who see a bright future for this industry, who are are great deliverers of messages as well. You know, a multitude of messengers help get those messages across. Um, And so it's the day-to-day interactions. It's the aforementioned, you know, fact sheets, information, you know, the food fight that we all call Twitter, um, LinkedIn, (laughs) other, other, you know, social media channels. Um, You know, uh, back on LinkedIn, you know, I think that's a very safe space for corporate folk that if they want to learn more, they can they could learn a lot more and actually, you know, inquire with people without it being, you know, construed as you're coming after me. You're you're it's a great environment to share information. And if we could share good solid facts with folks in the business community and elsewhere, that starts the ball rolling. We have our, our own grassroots network. We have I know there are other groups that have their own as as well, but you know, I strongly encourage people who listen to this, look us up, look at the website, look at our social media channels, look at me on LinkedIn, look at the coalition on LinkedIn, and let's keep the conversation going. Absolutely. Thank you, Dave. That's good stuff. And what is the website? Is it www.marcellusshalecoalition.com? It's just marcelluscoalition.org. Marcelluscoalition.org. Everybody should go ahead and check that out. Um, wanted to transition a little bit to some more of the personal side of things, Dave. So for you, uh, obviously, you're a passionate guy, you're doing your part to represent the industry in the best possible way in the Keystone State. But if you could tell me a little bit about like, what gets you up every day? What makes you tick? You've mentioned your 31 plus years in this industry. You know, clearly, you care about what you're doing. But what is it, you know, not just work wise, sort of on a personal level, what what gets you up and makes you tick? Uh, certainly, I have a lot of uh, uh, FOMO, that fear of missing out. So I like to consume a lot of information. First thing in the morning, quiet house, strong cup of coffee, reading everything from or glancing at everything from just Google News to get you know a quick overview to the Wall Street Journal to what's happening in Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, Philadelphia, elsewhere, my hometown, just consuming a lot of information so that I don't get caught flat footed if someone said, hey, did you hear about? Oh, yeah, I know that. Um, I love consuming that kind of information. But what really makes a difference for me in in my job and uh, in in any of the jobs that I've held is developing the relationships with people with whom I'm working, developing relationships with people across the aisle. If I'm talking to legislators and others on both sides of the aisle, it's about the personal connection that I think really makes a difference. It's what motivates people. I mean, you could have the worst job in the world. Now, I'm not going to identify one of those jobs, but you can think <laughs> of Mike Rowe, one of his jobs that he has done on sure. dirty jobs and think that's a literally shitty job. However, I guarantee you there are people out there doing that very same job who love it because they love the people they're working with. Damn, that is so good, man. <laughs> so you mentioned consuming information first thing in the morning. Let's talk about consuming food, Dave. Again, I, I think Jeremy shifted things to getting to know the real Dave here. Uh-oh. Let's talk about food. So again, you're in the center of the state. We talk about balancing, you know, not just politics, but sports. What about food? You know, who's what side of the state has the best food recommendations and guilty pleasures? Let's let's hear about what you like to consume other than you know, strong coffee and uh, and information first thing in the morning. I like everything. I'm half Italian, so I have a weakness <laughs> for Italian. And uh, it, I, I I don't I don't I don't claim that one side or end of the state has m- something better than the other. You know, I'm happy watching. Uh, if you haven't watched somebody feed Phil on Netflix, 
watch that guy travel all over the world just eating. That would be my dream job. Just go all over the world eating. And, you know, he doesn't show people actually making the food. That doesn't interest him. He just wants to eat it. That's my that's my thing. You know, Pennsylvania has a really unique food scene. Like Philly, I would say, see, you can't pick sides, Dave, but I can, right? Philly has incredible pizza, cheese steaks, Mediterranean food. You go to Pittsburgh, you're dealing with a lot of things, you know, Polish food, German food, pierogies, obviously the uh, uniqueness of um, the Primanti brothers sandwiches. So there's like a really good variety, Italian food, both places. There, there's a tremendous variety of food. And my wife, I've mentioned, she's from York, Pennsylvania. Her family's still in the uh, southeastern part uh, or south central to eastern part of Pennsylvania. And they have something out there called Foshnut Day. Foshnut. <laughs> Do you know about this? You must. Yes, yes. Everybody has their own version of, you know, the day before Lent begins, you pig out. So Fasnats are, you know, like I would assume the Pennsylvania Dutch version of, of whatever you would get in New Orleans, like a donut or something. So, yeah, same thing. If you're Italian, pizza free. You know, it, there's Maybe. many different ways of calling the same thing. So we make a big deal of, uh, of eating a ton of donuts you know, <laughs> before Lent begins. <laughs> My wife and one of her best friends, actually her roommate in college, are both from York and they went to Duke and they're talking about Fashnat Day. And people are like, you're crazy. Nobody knows what you're talking about. They're like, no, you're crazy. How do you not know about this? It's an amazing holiday. And they're like, you might want to do some more research on that. So apparently this is just like a very localized thing, which I thought is just hilarious, but uh, had to bring that one up. Uh, we're coming up on time here, Dave. I just want to, uh, first of all, thank you for being our first guest on What the Funk. You, you know, certainly I think you put a great face on the industry um, and are doing fantastic work with Marcellus Shale Coalition. Where can people find you? How can they reach out to you if you're willing to share that information and be an open book for others uh, to connect with? Sure. Again, you, you could find me on our website. You could find me on LinkedIn. Let's do that. Let's let's try that. Look me up on LinkedIn. Uh, we'll have a good conversation, uh, share some information and hopefully develop a relationship. As I said before, relationships matter. I look at the people that I have links with on LinkedIn. I like touching base with as many of them as possible and just to see how we can work together. I love it. I, I echo that sentiment. And Joe, why don't you... Uh take us home. Any thoughts you want to close us out with? I know our brains are just coming back to normal from the long Thanksgiving break, but I think we all stepped up to the plate here. Why don't you take us home, Joe? And what, what a way to follow up Thanksgiving break than by ending the podcast talking about food, right? We're right, <laughs> right, right back at it. You know, obviously, you know, thankful to you, Jeremy, again, for the invite to be part of this uh, kickoff of the new podcast. Thankful to Dave for not just joining us today, but for being such a, an engaging and, and uh, entertaining person in person. So again, I, I advise everybody to sign up and become a member of the Marcella Shell Coalition. If for no other reason, than if you think Dave is great on a podcast, he's even better in person at the uh, tremendous events that the MSC puts on. So I think that's my parting word is, you know, look for organizations like the MSC. If you feel like you're not, uh, you know, in this region or you don't have a connection, but first realize that in some way, shape or form, you probably are connected to the MSC and to Pennsylvania and to the Marcellus. If you happen to be listening to this podcast. So uh, give it a look. I can't say enough about the year plus that I've been a member. And uh, again, thankful to Dave, thankful to you, Jeremy, and thankful to everybody who decided to tune in to the first edition of What the Funk. What the Funk. Thanks, guys. <laughs>